that we had just these diagrams that looked like powers of so G naught, G naught, and these I naughts because these diagrams are all factorizable. Okay. So I can write down in closed form what this entire scattering amplitude would be, even if I summed it to all orders, because it's factorizable. So I get a one for the first term. I'm going to pull out a G naught. And then each loop adds one more uh, power of the coupling and one more power of whatever this loop integral is. This is a geometric series, so we can sum it. And this is what we get. So it goes like G naught over one minus G naught I naught. All of this is to say that we can use this effective field theory if we go back to our definition of the scattering amplitude in terms of the effective range expansion. Um, and in particular, if we just look at leading order in the effective range expansion, then we can relate a, the scattering length to G naught, the coupling. And so that's kind of the spirit of this effective field theory. So we've written this down. We need to tune the coupling to give us something physical. And so we can tune it to be the physical scattering length of whatever two nucleon system we're looking at. Okay, so I mean, you could also just think of this as an, a fancy effective range expansion, um, but you can do it systematically order by order in effective field theory. If you wanted to go to higher order, you can add some derivative terms, things that, uh, not G naught, things that go like some derivatives of these interactions and then it's more complicated but this is going to give you some p squared dependence from the gradient and so this g1 you could then relate to the effective range etc okay um so good so we can write down this effective field theory for two nucleon systems and now I want to talk about this fine tuning. And I just want to mention, I could have gone through all of this just from an effective range expansion point of view, but I did want to at least present the effective field theory because it then motivates a way that you could look at the pi on mass dependence of uh, the binding energies by adding pions to this theory. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But at the moment, I want to focus on the scattering amplitude and what it means to have fine tuning. So if we just look back at this leading order um, scattering amplitude, and by leading order, I mean we've expanded p cotangent delta to leading order in the effective range expansion. Just going to rewrite that here. Then we want to look for a bound state, which is a pole in our scattering amplitude. And this is pretty obvious. So there's a pole when P equals I over A. And now if I want to look at the binding energy of that bound state, again, we're in a non-relativistic theory. So this is going to go like, oh, sorry, not to M. So it's gonna go like P squared over M because we're in the center of mass uh, frame for the two nucleon system. But regardless of factors of two, the point is that the binding energy goes like 
1 over the scattering length squared. Okay. So if we're looking at, uh, yeah. If we're talking about finely tuned systems, we're talking about systems where the binding energy is very small, where it's near zero. This corresponds to a scattering length that's near infinity. And you may have learned from Roll's lectures that when the scattering length is infinity, this uh, saturates the unitarity bound. And so we call a system that has a weakly bound state as being a system at or near unitarity. And hopefully you've also seen the interpretation of the scattering lengths if we're looking at the wave function of this two particle system, the radial wave function, and we have some uh, attractive potential. So say we have some attractive potential well, that causes the radial wave function to kind of turn over. And if you draw back the what the asymptotic portion of the wave function is doing, and you look at the intersection with zero, this length here is a scattering length. So this is a scattering state because the wave function extends all the way to infinity. But if you make your well deeper, if you make it say very deep, it will cause the wave function to turn over completely. And you'll find that the wave function ends at around a distance A from the center. So we say that the scattering length tells us about the size of the bound state. And so if we're near unitarity, where the binding energy goes to zero, this is the in-between point where your well is just attractive enough to turn the wave function over such that it asymptotes at infinity. So another way to think about systems near unitarity is it's a near zero binding energy, and it's also a state that exists over a very large region of space. And both are true for the deuteron, which has the binding energy of 2.2 MeV. It's also a rather large state. And so one of the consequences of it being a very large state, so the wave function extends basically through all of space, if it's actually at unitarity, if it's near unitarity, it's just gonna be very large. The details of what's going on in this potential, whether it's a potential well, whether it's um, a Yukawa potential or some other form of potential, the bound state doesn't really see that because the two nucleons, the likelihood that they're actually going to be on top of each other enough to see the details of this interaction are very small because most of the time they're somewhere far away from that potential. So this is what we call a universal system. Systems near unitarity tend to probe the very, very low energy physics and not the very, very high energy physics. And so you can have systems that have very different types of potentials in even very different construction. But if they're near unitarity, then their behavior will be universal. And so we see evidence for universal behavior in two nucleons, the two nucleon system. Um, so I should point out that the physical scattering lengths for the neutron-neutron system is uh, about minus 24 Fermi, which is much bigger than the size of the potential, 
which is roughly the Compton wavelength of a pion, which is about one Fermi. So this two neutron system, it has the negative scattering lengths. So this corresponds to this system. So it's not a bound state. Um, it's in fact a virtual bound state, but still very near unitarity. And then the deuteron channel, the proton neutron scattering channel is about five Fermi, which is still significantly large compared to the size of the interaction. So as I was saying, these two nucleon systems um, will obey this characteristic universal behavior, which is also seen in completely different systems. So for example, um, nucleon nucleon systems will undergo superfluidity if you cool it down enough. And the same type of superfluidity is seen in, for example, cold atom systems where they tune the interaction between the atoms to be very near unitarity and cool it. They also have the superfluid state and the properties of those uh, superfluids are remarkably similar. And this uh, nucleon nucleon superfluid is very relevant for things like neutron stars, where you have lots and lots of cold neutrons, and they will form this uh, superfluid state. And, you know, nucleons and atoms, you might think they look nothing alike, and their interactions, the, the thing that they interact between, say, for nucleons, it might be through pion exchange, whereas between atoms, it might be between van der Waals forces. They're totally different, and yet you can still calculate properties of each and find that they're universal in both systems because of this near unitary behavior. All right. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to mention in this video, um, I wanted to just take a look at the residue of this bound state. And hopefully, again, you've seen this. This is just review from Raoul's lectures. Um, so the residue, we found a pole at P equals IA. So the residue of the amplitude to find that, and so this is the residue. Remember from complex analysis, we multiply by the pole. We multiply the scattering amplitude by the pole. So this is just the denominator of the scattering amplitude that we had before. And then we evaluate it at the pole. So I can pull out an I up top to make it look more like the bottom. And now these two guys cancel and I find that it's I. So the residue here is just one. Um, so this is good. The residue is positive and real, which means that it can physically correspond to a bound state. Um, so one of the little pre-class assignments that I'm gonna have you do is looking at the signs of residues in order to determine if I see if I'm looking for a pole in my scattering amplitude, can I trust whether it's a real bound state or not? Um, and I think that I will end this video there. All right.